everyone. Yeah. Welcome to tonight's program, an introduction to the Climate Action Plan for Belfast. I'm Brenda Harrison, the program librarian here at the Belfast City Library, and I'm the lead manager for the All of Belfast Climate Dialogue Project. <laughs> Um, back in 2020, the library won a grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services to create educational programs and facilitate conversations among a broad cross section of Belfast community about climate change to ensure that all voices and opinions were heard. To accomplish this, we hosted a series of educational programs on climate change. Many of them are on Zoom and many of them are recorded, and you can still watch them off of our um, website and YouTube. And then in June of 2022, we teamed up with the Belfast Climate Crisis Committee to host a series of four community climate conversations on the topics to be included in a Belfast Climate Action Plan. These conversations were designed to inform residents about the topics covered in the plan and solicit ideas for the Climate Action Plan being drafted by the Climate Crisis Committee. Members of the um, Climate Crisis Committee who all worked very hard to complete the Climate Action Plan are here tonight to introduce the plan to you. I'm really pleased to have this program to, tonight as it is the completion of a body of work that the ABCD project supported. Before we get to the plan, I wanna invite you all to come to the ABCD capstone presentation on Tuesday, August 29th at 5 p.m. And there's flyers in the back to remind you about. And we're gonna show you all that we've done, which is a lot more than just participation in this project. Um, first tonight, John Beal, the chair of what is now the Climate, Energy, and Utility Committee, will give a background on the Climate Action Plan, and then we will hear from Fred Bowers, Jerry Brand, Bernie Baker, and Barbara Bell. So take it away, John. <laughs> First of all, I'm really pleased to see so many people here on a beautiful summer night. <laughs> um, but uh, as Brenda said, we've been working with ABCD for almost two years now to create a climate action plan which reflects the concerns and um, worries uh, of the community. And I think uh, hopefully you've been able to pick up a paper copy of that. If you haven't, Perhaps those who are sitting next to people with one can share. Yeah, they're uh, all gone. People, all gone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm the chair right now of the Climate Energy and Utilities Committee. We just started July 1st, pursuant to the city manager's reorganization of all city committees. Um, before that, we were the Climate Crisis Committee, and Fred was the chair. Um, Fred and Jerry and Bernie and Barbara really led the creation of this climate action plan and I want to express my appreciation for that. Um, so the climate crisis committee was started in 2018 and our job was to um, raise awareness in the community about climate issues including sea level rise, research and recommend actions on mitigation and um, adaptation to climate change in the city council about data for local conditions. Sorry? Now I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, and to create links with other climate organizations throughout the state. Um, in 2019, Belfast joined the Global Covenant of Mayors, which is a worldwide organization of mayors concerned about climate and wishing to adapt and mitigate. Um, some of the obligations we undertook were to create and to um, do a greenhouse gas inventory, which we did and published in 2022. Um, then we we're also obligated to create a climate action plan, which we did. Uh, we had a long process of meetings uh, with the public and with ourselves, and we created um, this plan. And on June 4th, we submitted it to the city council. Um, with that, I would ask Bernie Baker. Whoa. <laughs> Good evening. I'm aware that the uh, 
the three B's of public speaking are be brief, be brilliant, and be seated. That's probably <laughs> two out of three. <laughs> so, um, quick look at uh, the mission goals. What I'm going to try to do very briefly in the next couple of minutes is to give you an outline of the vision and design of the climate action plan. And it starts with the goals for the cap. And it's worth uh, just going through them quickly. Belfast will achieve carbon neutrality by 2030 and a carbon zero status by 2045 in accordance with main well weight state targets. So much of what is in this uh, cap is built from the main well weight document. During this period, Belfast will make changes in its physical infrastructure and its governance to meet the challenges of the climate crisis while reducing the cost of inaction. So we're talking about physical infrastructure governance. We're also talking about attitudinal change so that um, we can work to have everyone in the city thinking about using a climate lens on all decisions going forward. Belfast will make these changes in ways that will increase economic activity and jobs. We want to uh, dispel the notion that development and sustainability um, are and that sustainability can uh, increase economic activity and jobs. Belfast will make these changes while maintaining its sense of community and supporting all of its citizens. The notion that um, climate justice and climate equity are also very important matters. So, what we discovered is that there was an absence of city policy for adaptation to climate change. And so, what our CAP does is to offer 17 policy recommendations to fill that void. And what we've done is identify um, eight crucial areas that comprise a comprehensive uh, view of what it means to uh, adapt to climate change and to approach uh, and confront the climate crisis. So under each critical area, the CAP offers a policy recommendation, which in the hard copy, um, or when you look at it online, is highlighted in yellow. And then after that policy recommendation, we offer um, uh, action, uh, immediate priority actions and long-term actions. And those um, are key to a sense of the uh, risk horizon. And also um, after going through the, the 17 policy recommendations, um, the gap includes four pages of potential funding sources because we know that um, many of these recommendations require significant investment. So there are more than 50 potential funding sources that have been identified for um, the city to pursue. So um, uh, what we're going to do quickly um, is to uh, look at the, the 17 uh, policy recommendations in those eight critical areas that uh, we designated. So starting with the notion of critical infrastructure, and if you look at the um, items that are listed there, wastewater treatment, storm system roads, marine facilities, and emergency services, you'll see right from the start that we're using a broad and comprehensive definition of infrastructure. It's not just uh, brick and mortar, but it's also the idea about um, shelters, food security. So uh, ways in which community infrastructure is broad and inclusive. And so um, the overall um, critical infrastructure recommended policy is to assess vulnerabilities in existing critical infrastructure plan to manage such systems for resilience to climate change. So first we have to know what our vulnerabilities are in all of those areas that you saw on the previous screen. 
And so now um, we're going to uh, go through those and look at um, each of these uh, policies and, and suggest um, briefly notions about them. Um, Jerry Brandon is the uh, resident engineer nerd. I got stuck with the, the uh, <laughs> talking about infrastructure and the things that have to happen. If we do our homework right as a community, sometime in the future, we'll uh, turn the taps and water will come out. And when we flush the toilet, it'll go somewhere. And uh, it's going to take some work to get there. Uh, the, the, <laughs> The goal is resilience. This this document is all about resilience and, and adaptation because there's not much we can do about rising sea level uh, and changing water. You know, there's no way to build a giant wall. The, uh, the the essential problem is that our old infrastructure here in the city is designed around past history of weather. In other words, if there were we're used to a certain amount of steady rainfall every year. It used to be in Maine that you got regular rainfall a little bit every month. It's great. And it used to be that the uh, the uh, sea level was, you know, pretty constant or going up slowly. And, the, and it used to be that the winds were reasonable, you know, anything under 50 mile an hour being reasonable. Uh, today, that's out the window. So we have to deal with... Um, Episodic rainfall in the past couple of years, I think you've noticed that there's been times when we get five inches of rain in three hours, approximately. And uh, <clears throat> we are uh, followed by drought. You know, so it rains like hell and then it doesn't. And we have that, that's a change. We have to accommodate. And a, uh, in the future, water, instead of being something that we've put into the, you know, we flush the toilet. With eventually goes into the bay and our storm drains all lead to the bay in the future we're going to have to be thinking about conserving that water potable water will be a new resource that we have to think seriously about and uh that's and the the other thing that we're probably going to have to contend with is our winds won't be limited to 50 miles an hour you know over the normal course of things you know the hurricanes have been very rare here in the city we're probably going to see uh, more, more potential for that. So uh, the wastewater treatment system, the, I don't know if anybody uh, familiar with the wastewater treatment system here in Belfast. It's a, what you call a state-of-the-art system that uh, currently deals with about 600,000 gallons a day. And it's got a, when both uh, settlement tanks, settling tanks are operational, it's got about 2 million gallon a day capacity. And that primarily deals with people in the city limits. Unfortunately, some of us live with a separate system. That works, but that doesn't come into the, the uh, calculation. So virtually every bit of the water that goes into the, sub, into the uh, uh, city treatment plant comes from our aquifer. So we're, we're basically putting 600,000 gallons a day of fresh water through the waste treatment plant into the bay. Okay. And our, when we have a major storm, all of that water collected by the uh, uh, stormwater system goes into the bay also. And that's probably not, we won't have that luxury in the future, but that has to be contended with. The, uh, interestingly enough, the wastewater treatment plant the door for the treatment plant is at the 14 foot uh, level. Uh, what am I trying to say? You know, when you, when you do a plot, we're about at the 14 foot level, high tide is about 13.2 feet. So, with a moderate amount of sea level rise, you can see we've got an issue. Yeah. And the, the other issue is there's are three massive pumps that are at the inlet side of the waste treatment plant and they pump through the system. That's all in a in a uh, pit, a uh, concrete pit, well below sea level. So there's some vulnerability there. Things have to change. And uh, that's in the recommendations to read the plan about what we have to do about that at a minimum. The uh, stormwater system, max capacity. Our stormwater system, elements of it are probably close to 100 years old. 
Uh, the city's done a great job of maintaining what we have. And uh, and the current task, there's actually a program going on to find out where everything is and uh, map out the stormwater system, find out where everything goes and uh, evaluate the pipes and see what kind of condition they're in. But like I say, elements of it are still pretty old. We had a storm recently of about five inches of rain in three hours. Uh, and it pretty well, pretty well demonstrated that's the limit that the stormwater system can take without severe flooding. At that point, we still had severe flooding. And uh, since that time, we've had two, maybe three storms that were of the same level. Unfortunately, we didn't have that severe flooding. Uh, Fred has an excellent picture it's in, in this document that, uh, that shows the, the consequences of uh, the failure of the stormwater system. And it, it's pretty clear that the uh, roadways will not be usable for a period of time under, the, under those kind of circumstances. So that's another thing that has to change. Okay, I gotta, I gotta be careful with time or, or uh, mm -hmm. a certain lady is gonna read the book. <laughs> the uh, roads, uh, several of our roads, well, we've got a basic problem here because the roads that are inside the city limits are the, the uh, prerogative, that that's the property of the city, and that's the responsibility of the city to maintain. Unfortunately, to, to get in and out of Belfast, those are state roads, and you have to collaborate with the state in order to make changes to that road system. The, uh, uh, the present design, there are several sections on, uh, on the road, particularly on the input and output outside the city limits that are actually at or close to sea level. So again, a certain amount of sea level rise is going to make those impassable during any kind of a reasonable storm. So the uh, we have to start thinking about that kind of thing. I know when I was recently riding up Route 1A towards, uh, you know, uh, well, Stockton Springs and, uh, and further, further up. And there's portions of that that are now close to being underwater, any kind of reasonable high tide and storm. Uh, marine facilities and access. The uh, I'm also on the on the, the uh, harbor committee. Uh, unfortunately, finishing my term shortly. And the uh, we have a project under undergoing uh, right now to raise the level of the breakwater and, and to bring it into the modern age. It's about at the end of its life. Uh, raise it by three foot. And, you know, the goal is extend it by 60 feet, raise it by three to eliminate the curb, and, and provide a facility that provides better protection and better mooring or safe mooring for larger boats. And uh, that's about an $11 million project. And that's that's going to be a challenge to fund. Uh, the city's in the process of trying to find the funding for that now. That's only step one. Actually, I'd almost say it's step zero in protecting our harbor. The west side of the harbor, for the most part, is right near that 13.2 high tide. And so just a modest amount of uh, sea level rise is going to make the west side of the harbor uh, flooded periodically. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, a big, that's a big challenge to figure out how to, that's the next step, figure out how to protect the harbor and maintain it. Either that or you make the choice to back off and you know, abandon it. I doubt if that'll be very uh, popular with a lot of the people that have invested so much in harbor infrastructure. So that's that's a challenge there. And the, the one thing we can't do much about, uh, sea level rise, perhaps you can do something. Uh, the one thing we can't do much about is storm surge. You know, it, 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 it's hard to figure out how to, how to handle a, a variable that's dependent upon the severity of the storm and, that, and the amount of time it takes for that storm to pass. That generates up to six to eight foot of storm surge. Uh, we just have to survive that. Okay. My, my time, time is up yet? Okay. Emergency services and facilities. Do I skip anything? No. Okay. Emergency services and facilities. Right now, we, we have a problem. Uh, how many? People have uh, heard their cell phone uh, beep 
with an emergency uh, declaration, you know, severe flooding or whatever. Yeah, I am. It scared the hell out of me. I didn't know what it was. We have an issue with uh, reaching everyone in the city. And that's, that's really an equity issue. Uh, not everybody has uh, TV or have it turned on at the right time when you get your normal uh, emergency declaration. Not everybody has a cell phone that's turned on or, or signed up for this emergency warning system. We have to figure out how to maintain or how to get emergency warning to all of the people you know, that, that could be possibly affected by it. Uh, back in the bad old days, they used to, at least down in New Hampshire where I'm from, they used to uh, light off the, the uh, siren. The city had a siren. And you, uh, if you heard that siren go, you knew something was up. That, that made you a little tech away. Um, communication system. Uh, right now, we're very dependent upon uh, DHF for emergency services, cell phones for you know communicate. Some people never drop their cell phone, uh, and um, some people still like I, we still have a wired telephone. But that one of the first things you have to we have to concern ourselves is well, what happens when the power goes out? Is the uh, do all the cell phone power towers have sufficient reserve capacity if their battery backed up to last the duration of an emergency? Because that's not an essential uh, tool for communications. And one possibility is that, first of all, we make sure that that happens. And the second thing is we, we could adopt a uh, voluntary Wi Fi mesh network for you people or us people that have. Uh, Computer systems where we have Wi Fi, you could uh, end up linking those Wi Fi together and creating your own network for emergency purposes. So that, that's that's one idea that's present in, the, uh, in this document. I think it, it's been done before, uh, typically in larger cities where people are closer together. Public shelters. For the first time ever, we're in a position of uh, having uh, a climate where hot weather is a concern, especially to the very old and the very young. Uh, when you've got a wet bulb temperature of 95 degrees, which means a combination of temperature and humidity that's equivalent to 95 degrees, that's the, what they call a real feel. Uh, you're at the end of your string in terms of being able to work outside or be outside under those conditions and maintain your body temperature. You know, the sweating no longer works. How, you know, to put it simply. So, we need to be thinking about shelters for both hot and cold. Or, in the past, the only time you had to worry about a shelter is when you got five foot of snow or something like that. You know, right now, in the city, we don't have an organized system of shelters that's adequate for any kind of a longer than a few hours. So, that's one thing that has to be addressed. And that shelter hopefully is self-sustaining. In other words, if the power goes away, the shelter is still usable. You know, it's got backup power. And uh, and that shelter should also be capable of triage in the case of a public health emergency. You know, we recently, if you've seen the internet lately, you've noticed that there's uh they discovered that a certain small worm could live for that had been frozen for 64,000 years can be revived. <laughs> but that rolled the bacteria and viruses, simple uh, worms are much more complex critters. So, mm. you know, we can expect that uh, pandemics are not going to be unique in, a, in the distant future. So we need this shelter that can, can help with that problem, you know, triage for in the case of the pandemic, which we, in the past one, we had, uh, you know, uh, various facilities that we gave shots to and, and help people out who need to have that kind of thing. Food security. Uh, that place, the Belfast Soup Kitchen, turns out that's a, a private nonprofit, and it's now the hub of food security in, in Waldo County. The, the numbers of people since during the pandemic and since the pandemic ended that are making use of that service, that the food that they provide have gone through the roof. In fact, it's tested the ability of uh, 
to be a state of find enough food and, and deliver it. And they now cover all of Walden County. So there's uh, about three other pantries within the city system here that provide food on a, but not on a, on a daily basis. Somehow within our, within our, and I'm gonna make a statement that could get me in trouble here. We have to start considering that within the city budget, there is some amount of regular funding that's programmed to support these sorts of activities. Is that, you know, uh, food is meant for I mean, you have to either pay me now or pay me later in terms of providing adequate sources of food. So um, I guess with that, who's next up? John. John, you're the man. Thanks, Sheriff. Um, so as you can see, we're looking at worst case scenarios because there's a possibility that each of those worst cases is going to come in the near or distant future, and it's worth planning for them now. That's what this climate action plan is about. One of the things that we did is a global uh, a greenhouse gas inventory to determine where our greenhouse gases are coming from in Belfast. And as reflected in the plan, 49% came from gas and diesel um, transportation. Um, so one of the things we want to do is to create a transportation network that produces less uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, electric vehicles are a very good start on that. And one of the things we recommend is monitoring and uh, modifying the EV charging systems here to uh, meet the needs, the hopefully growing needs for EV charging. We also want to encourage infrastructure changes that will support bicycling and walking. But um, we also have to look at equity. And we have a large elderly population with a substantial disabled population. Biking and walking are not adequate to address those. So we want to work with um, the uh, global, the uh, Waldo CAP that has its uh, private system, which right now will get you to the grocery store and get you to your medical appointments, but nobody really could use them to go to work on a regular basis because of their schedule. So we want to work with them to increase the uh, adequacy of public transport as a substitute for gas cars. So um, we made recommendations. Uh, to uh, monitor the EV charging and assist CAP. Those were our first immediate priority actions. And then we recommend converting the city fleet to electric or other um, alternate fuels, um, increasing bicycling and pedestrian safety of crossing highways, uh, expanding bike lanes, uh, talking about the availability of electric lawnmowers and other electric facilities. Um, and to otherwise uh, increase the very ways of transportation about gas without increasing uh, gas uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The next item is buildings and homes. Uh, buildings and homes, business and uh, residents, supplying 49 for uh, 50 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions, because most of us have uh, fossil fuel heating. Um, Maine has the greatest percentage of fuel oil heating in the country. And uh, changing that over to non-polluting methods is one of our first recommendations. Um, we were very pleased that one of the first things the city did in terms of this plan was to make an application uh, under the Community Residency Partnership for a $50,000 grant to help uh, survey and install heat pumps for heating and cooling into the city buildings. Uh, that, would, that would be a first step to get that grant into converting away from fossil for the city. Um, we want to have the city enforce uh, the new construction requirements for energy conservation and weatherization, and adopt uh, more stringent codes for emphasizing energy efficiency. We want to have a 
public program to encourage and support people purchasing um, heat pumps, both for heating and cooling. Uh, I didn't know there were such good cooling methods. There, there actually are right. people, a lot of people don't have air conditioning. And if we can create a system where the heat pumps supply both heat and air conditioning to them, it's a, it's a good transition. Um, we want to lead by example with auditing. We want to create a system whereby we can support um, reaching out into the community to see who needs help with their weatherization who needs help with their heat pumps, um, who needs help being contacted uh, during hot weather. Um, I've spoken with a community nurse here. Um, there are a lot of people who don't have your air conditioning and don't have access to people with air conditioning. And on hot days, they just sit at home and smoke them. She has gone to several places and bought air conditioners for them. Mm -hmm. That's not a public health approach. We want a systemic approach. Um, so, um, oh, and one of the things we said for a long-term action was developing a central program to assist homeowners and rental property owners to upgrade existing housing stock. Well, effective July 1st, the city just created the Housing and Property Development Committee. And its goal is to create more affordable housing for Belfast. And one of the ways that will happen is through a, a program to increase uh, the availability of housing as we just discussed. So um, that's our business homes, buildings, homes, and businesses uh, check. Fred? Jerry. Jerry. Okay, another nerd topic, the uh, electric cars. I'm sure all of you are aware of that the uh, the big push to decarbonize, quote unquote, is uh, throws the major throws in the uh, major solution to that is an electric car, and uh, the, the concept is that uh, current generation uh, sources are emit carbon for the most part. You know, they run off of, used to be run off of coal. That's not so very common anymore. Maine is great in the sense that 77 percent of our power comes from renewables and gas fire uh, generation facilities. So we're already way ahead of the power curve in terms of no pun intended in terms of the rest of the country. However, there's a challenge. The uh, if you're going to make electric power your only major source of energy. And accomplish the other things that you're just talking about, where you install heat pumps in your in your homes and you drive electric vehicles, EVs. Uh, our our consumption, our electric power consumption of electric power will go up by two to three times. So if you're currently you've got a 100 amp panel that's stretched to the limit, you're going to need a 200 panel in the future. And uh, how do we how do we uh, uh, a accomplish that? And B, make best use of our renewable sources. You know, we, my wife and I invested in a uh, heat pump system to put a solar PV system on the roof for a six kilowatt system. What's going to cost us? We had to bid about $17,000. That did not include storage. And uh, so you don't solve the problem of when the lights go out, they still go out. You know, in other words, that, that solar PV has with no storage compound uh, only helps during the times when you don't need it. So, so the uh, my my solution to this, and one of the things I'm uh, looking to advocate for is a we need to know how much power we're consuming currently in this city around a 24-hour cycle and a 365-day year. So we have a base, a, a base to figure you know, to understand, and and then you go you go and multiply that times two and say that's what we have to provide in the future, and that's got to come from somewhere. And one way to make good use of our renewables is to establish this is this is my thing that I'm going to get shot for is to establish a uh, microgrid. Now, Belfast is its own microgrid. With the capability of running offline if it had to, being ice, what they call islanded. That requires storage, mass storage. 
And uh, the good news is there, you know, the, the advantage of the mass storage, the, the price is coming down, the technology is working uh, in the right direction in terms of providing the capability of what you call a grid scale storage, where you're talking megawatt hours. Uh, and if I were to take my home TV system and provide local storage, it's cost me additional 10 grand for a six kilowatt system. And that would provide a limited amount of backup. If you, uh, in the same condition, if you go and you um, have grid scale storage in our Belfast microgrid, you can now take your PV and that instead of just providing for me, that feeds back into the system and is uh, stored in grid scale storage, they cost about 20% of what I'd have to pay. You know, in, in terms of the, uh, in fact, even less as things go on as time goes on. So that, that, that's a solution. And the other solution is instead of putting a, if you get an EV, instead of having a charger that simply runs off house power and charges your EV, if that e charger is bi-directional, what, what I mean by that is, and when power is available, it charges your EV. When the lights go off, your EV becomes a battery backup system for your house and also for, for the rest of the grid. And, and the, and the uh, batteries in, in uh, pure EV vehicles are pretty substantial, and there's a lot of power available there. So the combination of those sort of things gives us uh, two things, capacity, and resilience, and that's what we that, that's where we have to go with that. And with that, we're on to the next topic, which is Fred. Fred's the topic. <laughs> I get to talk about the birds and bees. Uh, natural resources are the topic that you know, there are a couple more slides. The the way I look at life is life is just so much better when you have natural world around you. And like this photo, of, as you all know where it is, mm -hmm. this is what we get to see here. We want to keep it that way. We do not want to uh, be, be incautious and end up cutting every tree down and <laughs> uh, building every square foot of our natural resources. We don't want to do that. We, we know what that looks like. We've all been to other places. So the um, the federal and state conservation goals are to try to achieve 30% of conservation by 2030. Well, we'll we'll work on it. And and here, I mean, you know, we we have fortunately the various groups like the, you know the Coastal Mountains Land Trust who do this sort of thing for with with our help in the Belfast Bay watershed. So, but the city, they, they have parks, we have good parks, we have great parks, but, uh, you know, we, we think, you know, we could add a little bit of extra effort in this approach. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that's the first one. And then we'll get to a little specifics with the, the um, by the way, that's my house, that one on the left. So I, because there's this apple tree, it's just wonderful. And <laughs> birds, and you, you really can't imagine what you do, but there are so many levels of birds that the trees have. And so we get all the good birds coming through because they like the apples and there are some berry trees. And then, uh, so anyway, my point being is that we want to save the conservation in general, but I also have a real dear wish to, to preserve habitat. It's so important to have habitat. You can't just have trees that are, you know, 150 years old that uh, become infested with something and or just die of old age. You cut them down and then where are you? You're starting out with a sapling that will take a hundred years to become a tree again. So there, there really needs to be a little more attention to what I would call the shrub layer um, in, in the urban zone. And then of course, outside the city, uh, felt the, uh, the Route 1, outside of that, then we do have forests. I mean, and we have also uh, good soils, but not lots of good soils. So there again, we need to make sure we protect 
the prime soils that we have with the soils of statewide significance. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of covers that one. And then we also want to talk about uh, shoreline. You want me to talk about forest first and then you go to shoreline. So, so the other one is the forest. <clears throat> um, I happen to have a degree in soil, forest soils. That's my degree area. And uh, I love it, of course. And you learn a lot when you do that one because you have to learn geology and you have to learn the botany and the ecology and so on. And so um, I, I produced this little drawing and you can have, there's a, there's a document associated with it. If you're on the back row, there's a QR code. You can take a photo of it and download this file, which talks about the, the idea that I have for urban forest. And, um, but the bottom line is, is you can't start out with this tree. When, when you cut down one of those trees, you've got to start with the little trees. And that's just life, but we, we need to keep replenishing the different layers of forest inside of the, the bypass area. Outside of the bypass area, it's naturally forest. The only thing is, of course, is that houses go up and they cut the trees down. And what does that do? Well, it does a couple of things. Obviously, it turns into lawn, probably. It also ends up eliminating some of the carbon sequestration capabilities that you have um, now, as soon as you dig up the, the uh, or kill the the actual wood or the woody plants, then you're you're not helping carbon sequestration, which is an important way that we can help bring down the amount of carbon in our atmosphere. So forests are really super important to that. Um, and also back there, I just want to remind there, the 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 14 foot contour line that, that Jerry mentioned. And the, if you go back there, there's also a QR code that you can put, you know, photo in and download a atlas that shows all the properties that will around the, the, the whole bay here that will be affected by a rise of three feet of sea level. So that's something that you can all have. You can download <laughs> that anytime. Um, so that I think brings us to Bernie. Yeah. That was a good uh, segue to talking real quickly about shoreline. Um, everybody has heard a lot about the sea level rise and storm surge and the necessity to uh, replace the breakwater in order to uh, protect city landing and um, all kinds of issues on uh, the west side of the harbor. But, uh, and a lot of work has to be done there and that's gonna be very expensive work. There's also the notion that there are some 200 uh, pieces of property in the city of Belfast that um, are shoreline pieces of property. And the question is, um, how can, uh, individuals or community groups um, seek to uh, preserve and protect um, their property. And so um, one of the things that uh, I think is important is to develop uh, a guidance document that describes the procedure for obtaining permits and to and the variety of methods of strengthening the coastline, different forms of armoring, uh, and also um, depending on the nature of your shoreline to implement nature-based solutions as opposed to um, more engineered solutions. So we have to look at a variety of ways for individuals, for community groups, for neighborhood uh, groups to collaborate in order to think about how to protect um, the shoreline and how to protect uh, increasing amounts of erosion. So those efforts um, are uh, certainly part of, an enormous part of what has to happen in addition to 
be um, dealing with the breakwater and the city infrastructure, especially on the western side of the heart. So publicizing, developing that information, publicizing it, um, encouraging broader adoption of flood insurance, and um, encouraging collaboration uh, among individuals, neighborhoods, and community groups. Uh, I am the next. Yeah. I'm going to go to public health. So um, I have the last three sections. After I finish my presentations, we're going to have a QA session. Uh, hopefully, you have some questions, um, and Bernie will lead that discussion. Um, the last comment he made about seawalls is just a really nice illustration of why we need to be collaborating when we approach climate change. If you build a seawall on your property and you don't, your neighbors don't, all you're doing is diverting the force of the water to your neighbor. So you need to collaborate and cooperate when you do things like that. Um, public health is the next issue. What is public health? Don't we have a good hospital and lots of doctors? We do. So public health is a broader community approach to prevention and information. Um, we are going to have more ticks. We're going to have more mosquito-borne illnesses. As temperature and um, weather changes, we're going to confront new disease vectors that we haven't thought of. We also, <clears throat> if you look at what's happening in the rest of the country <laughs> and the rest of the world, we're going to have climate migration. People during the pandemic, did you notice we had some new people come to town? That's going to happen on steroids uh, in the future. And we need to be prepared to welcome those people and to prepare for the challenges they will bring. Um, we already have a lot of old and disabled people. Um, we need to be able to cheat, uh, quick, um, treat them for the changes that are going to come. We have one public health nurse in Belfast, and she is hardworking and overworked. Uh, we need to um, create a new system for information to the public about the hazards that are going to be here and the solutions that are going to become available. Um, the, uh, the next area, and I guess the other one is community outreach. Um, between 2018 and 2021, we had a number of programs, many of them in this room, about sea level rise, solar power, uh, emergence, the declaring a climate emergency, uh, student organizing, EVs, lots of really interesting programs. And many of those are taped and again available uh, on the city website or through Brenda. Um, beginning in 2022, working with Brenda's group, we had uh, a number of programs, including a Shimmerline Protection Program um, and the CAP program. Our job as a community, as a um, committee, is a lot of it is about public education and public exposure to the ideas uh, that we're going to have to confront in the next few decades. And we we'll continue to do that. Um, and we will continue to have programs like this. Uh, my last section is called The Next Generation. Mm -hmm. And it <clears throat> acknowledges the fact that many of the people in this room um, are of a certain age and that we don't have a lot of youth present here today or present on our um, committee. We want to increase that. We want to get involvement from the youth. We have had a collaboration with Belfast Area High School for the past four years. We had a student member on our committee, uh, and that student helped us to collaborate and cooperate with the high school's climate, climate crisis committee. Um, the students, uh, we, we got the city council to allow us to have a student member, despite the fact that the students aren't 18. And one of the rules for the city is if you're a committee member, 
You have to be a resident of Fort Worth, of Alabama. You have to be 18 years or older. You have to be a registered voter. Well, none of the students meet that. So we got them to waive those requirements. We also got them to allow us to work directly with the high school to bring the students to us and become members. They didn't have to go through the process of, of interview and approval by the city council. Why is that? Because the students are really busy and they sometimes have to change and having them have to go through the process with the city would take what, weeks, months. So we just work directly with the school. It's worked fine. Um, we intend to have a new student member of our new committee. In fact, it's on our agenda for Thursday. Um, and um, we think that uh, they will reactivate the Climate Action Club at the high school. Um, our the recommended policy is to have the city continue reaching out to students. Um, I mean, for instance, one of the things they did is that if you look down on the pier, there's a weather station and two um, high gauges, all of which the kids help with. There are the six observation posts of the coastal flooding project all around the coast. They help put those up. Um, and so when engaged, they can be great participants. Mm -hmm. And it's a great part of their education to work with these challenges. So we intend to keep that going um, and as, have that as part of our climate action plan. So having given you almost an hour of our thoughts, um, I'll turn it over to Bernie, who will run the Q&A session. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just before uh, we start the Q&A, one last notion, and that is we've given a lot of information here, and a lot of it is scary, and um, but what this document is, um, is a roadmap. This is a roadmap for the city to use to address eight different critical areas, short term and long term uh, visions for actions. And um, our hope is that um, the, the, the city will take this up in earnest. And many of these uh, actions are ones that are specific to the city and administration, but some of them are also for the community as a whole and also for individuals. And I guess the thing that uh, we want you to think seriously about and to come away with is um, the key word in this um, climate action plan is action. And it's going to require everybody being involved and being willing to roll up their sleeves, whether it's dealing with their own property or in the neighborhood or actions that the city administration has to take. But this is a roadmap. And what we need is enthusiasm and um, hard work in order to together implement this so that Five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, Belfast will be thriving and sustainable kids and our grandchildren and so on and so forth. So what I'd like to do is open it for questions and just so um, we can hear, um, uh, I'll pass you the microphone so I don't have to repeat the question and then um, I'll pass you Someone who's going to answer it. <laughs> so, who has a question? Hi, I'm Chris. Um, my question is about um, insulating homes, weatherization, and how is that going to be done? Because that seems to be a really basic thing to give people to save on energy and to make places more comfortable for people. Do you have a question? 
organizations are funding, you know, one, one of the things we have collected tonight so far, which we're going to get into, is the things that you can do yourself, do your own house, property, that can help with this whole problem. And weatherization is one of them. Efficiency Maine uh, has a lot of help. If you go to the Efficiency Maine website, uh, they have a lot of help with the uh, various things you can do to weatherize and financial help under certain circumstances for people that uh, say can't afford to insulate their house properly. Uh, the, uh, there's no question about, well, one of the things I did in, in well, over the past seven years or so was be involved with window dressers. You get, I'm sure some of you are familiar. In fact, I know some of you have helped build window inserts. That's one thing that you can do to weatherize your house. It's very cost effective and it's a volunteer thing. It costs you about 40 bucks an insert. Uh, one of the women that I talked to early on had pursued window dressers as an alternative to buying a uh, conventional uh, storm window for her uh, high end windows. It was going to cost her a thousand bucks per window. <laughs> and she had 35 windows. So, so uh, window dressers is a cost-effective way to, to approach that. She's extremely happy. Uh, other things you can do, basically, number one thing, insulate. For God's sake, you know that that that's the most effective thing you can do to conserve energy in your house. Uh, one of the things I'm considering is my oil boiler. It's not that old, but it's not that efficient, and the cost of oil is going up. Uh, a uh, transitioning to a propane boiler. Uh, win, it's a win in several directions. Uh, that the, uh, even though propane per BTU is more costly than oil, the efficiency is much higher. And the uh, kind of um, maintain, maintenance you have to do on a, on a, a gas fired uh, boiler is much lower relative to oil. So that, that's a good transition. I'm just concerned that. Um, the whole town needs to be winterized. And I'm wondering um, if we can have a program to make that happen. I'm you know, going to speak, Chris, I'm going to speak to this. So it is a passion of mine to help that happen. Okay. Yeah. That's not something the city's going to do. I mean, face it, they're not. Okay. That's something a climate action team or not a local nonprofit could organize around getting funding to help people. And they can do it neighborhood by neighborhood. It's been done on Mount Desert Island by a Climate to Thrive. There are plenty of models out there. We just need somebody to lead the way. The city's not going to do that for individuals. They're just not. How can they do that? Yeah. It's a it's a community based project, in my opinion. In my opinion, I don't know if you can all disagree. Um, it would be wonderful if the city could get grant money to help seed something like that. I don't know as if it's priority. Yeah. Also, one of the things that uh, has happened around uh, the state and certainly can happen in Belfast, it just takes collect initiative are, are to um, do collective purchasing. Yeah. And that drives the price down considerably. And uh, groups of citizens can get together and um, collectively purchase insulation or heat pumps or other things, some through um, efficiency main and others through um, particular contractors. So um, that model's been effective throughout um, the state and we can do that here. It's a, a matter of collaboration. <laughs> Um, this is not a question. This is a, a comment. Um, I, as a citizen of Belfast, uh, certainly appreciate all the effort and work that had to go into this working document because uh, as reading it and, you know, as one who has volunteered in the community, the time and effort and the expertise that the community brought to this is outstanding. And I just want to say thank you. Hi. Yes, we have a climate action plan, and I believe it has been presented to the council. 
Um, what what happens now? I mean, is it adopted? Is is it sitting there? Um, what's the next step here? <laughs> <laughs> the chair gets to answer that. <laughs> so we um, we submitted on June fourth. We were going to have a workshop with them well, a few days later. That got supplanted by a different workshop. Um, it has not been rescheduled yet. Um, I am pleased to say that it was used in on the June sixth discussion about the choice of the project to put into uh, Augusta for the resiliency partnership. And the economic director of Belfast used our plan as one of the sources of his recommendations. So right now it is, as you said, sitting in front of the council. We hope and expect that they will meet with us and adopt it. Um, adopting a city a climate action plan is important for seeking grants and other projects, uh, both in state and federal. So it behooves the city to have a climate action plan and we've given them what we think is a pretty good one. If anybody wants to make comments about it to them as what make the decisions, feel free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, there are several vacancies um, on the new climate energy and utilities committee and so if any of you are interested in um, getting involved rolling up your sleeves and uh, working with us um, go to uh, city hall and put out an application to serve on the committee so uh, you mentioned collaboration quite a bit this mention of uh, collective action. And I'm, I'm wondering what you ran into as you did your work um, as far as uh, not invent, not reinventing the wheel, things that you saw that other, other communities were doing, other counties, even you know, other states. Um, you know, we all know that a lot of stuff should be happening. And I'm just curious how much stuff is already happening that we can, that it looks like we might be able to tap into for what the trend is anyway. Okay, Barbara. My name is Barbara Bell. I am not on the climate crisis, but the current um, climate, um, energy, and utility committee. Um, but I have participated in making this plan and doing being on the committee beforehand. I do have a couple of comments to make about this particular question, which is a very good question. When one uh, work that was happening in many cities around Maine around climate change is that towns have hired a sustainability coordinator. Some of them share a sustainability coordinator most of them have separate ones. Um, and we, in one part of this plan, in the front of the introduction, we did suggest that. But we're not at all um, optimistic that the city will ever hire a sustainability coordinator for a lot of reasons that I won't go into this minute because the the interesting part of this question, which leads to something we haven't talked about too much, has to do with what the sustainability coordinator might do. And really, this person, well, often they're used as a grant writer, which is, of course, a good function. But the real job of such a person, ideally, is to coordinate within the city staff in understanding what data they need to undertake some of these projects. And really, Belfast has very little data. Um, it's amazing how little they have. 
because um, they have staff that's very competent and good, but those staff have a lot of it right up here. <laughs> they don't have it on paper, they do not have it on computers, mm -hmm. and they really need it now because they're facing a huge problem. So at any rate, that's something the sustainability coordinator needs to do, would need to do. But then you then you run into the question, but these are all fiefdoms, all the departments, they all have their budgets. And now somebody comes in from the outside and says climate change touches all of your departments, and you all need to share this data that you don't even have yet. And <laughs> you need to develop it with computer systems that don't go together because the planning department, for instance, uses a different computer system than, than the public works does and so forth. This is a big problem. And no, when you get right down to the nitty gritty, the city manager has to be the sustainability coordinator. And that's a very tough sell. Um, and most city managers are not, not prepared to do that. And so the coordination <coughs> of the staff and the economic development person who's ending up writing these grants, that person has to know a lot more than they do about the problems that have to do with climate change and read a comprehensive roadmap like the one that we produced and really understand it and know the different uh, ditches involved with all these different things. So I'm leaving that and just talking about that and maybe you to think about that giant problem. I'll just say one more comment about this business of collaboration. A lot of things can be done, like weatherization, like the problem of armoring along the coastline, like um, sharing information about insurance of your properties and so forth. A lot of these things can be done in neighborhoods. The problem, and we have neighborhoods in Belfast. They're all great neighborhoods. Some of them, have large gaps in them because people don't live here a lot of time. That's a problem with coordination and collaboration. But at one point when we were working on the shoreline properties uh, uh, conference that we had, which was very well attended, we had it in the boathouse for any property owners along the shoreline, and a lot of property owners did come when we we sent letters to every single one of them. Um, and then a lot of non shoreline people came. We started thinking, how could we organize the shoreline people? And then we realized there are all these little pockets of neighborhoods around. And they all, each neighborhood knows who they are, but we don't have enough people on the committee to go and find out who. John Smith is, or who Betty Wilbur is, or you know, who's who's sort of the person who knows all the people in that neighborhood. But you, you sitting out here in the audience, you do know the people in your neighborhoods. And I think it would be it would be good if we could somehow set up um, a list of of neighborhood people who are interested in climate action. And there's that can only be done by, um, by people like you in, in this room and plenty of others who can't be heard about and whatever. So that's workable. And those are my thoughts about collaboration. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I want to say something. Yeah. <laughs> I've, uh, on several occasions, I've been in front of the city council holding to their face that for my many sins, my punishment would be to be elected to city council. <laughs> I, uh, I really appreciate the 
staff members and the city council are doing a great job. Their job is to keep the place running. They don't have the bandwidth you know, to deal with a magnitude, an overlay of tasks of this magnitude. That's where the, the advisory committee is of some help, but the bottom line is it's going to have to be a community effort to make to accomplish many of these things. Like I say, there's things we can do in our own property. There's things that can be done collectively. And I would invite anybody that's younger than I am to get active. <laughs> and, you know, it's time for that. So just briefly, in, uh, in the service of bureaucratic as covering, I will say <laughs> we have not recommended that the um, <clears throat> the coordinator be the city manager. So, <laughs> um, we have not suggested that. <laughs> but I will say that that the information and collaboration goes both ways, up and down. For instance, I've been very concerned after thousands of people died in the Northwest last year about heat because. Yeah. In Belfast, we're not used to handling heat. So I'm trying to push that unsuccessfully. John, put the mic closer to me. And um, recently, I got a hold of the state um, coordinator for policy for us and asked the question, what's the, what's the, uh, what are the recommendations? Well, they're working on it. And they're working on a set of recommendations. So it's not right now, but soon we'll have a set of recommendations about how to address heat in Maine. And we can all adopt it, and we'll have some authority to do that. Um, so, collaboration. This is a new, this is a new problem. Really, no one's been thinking about climate this minutely within the last ten years. This is a new problem to develop. So, collaboration will occur, and it'll take some time. Also, uh, in the process of creating uh, this uh, cap, we um, talked to other communities, got copies of the climate action plans that um, they produce, so that, um, and we are sharing that kind of information. And there's also important organizations, uh, Brenda mentioned uh, Climate to Thrive, and Fred's going to talk real briefly about local leads the way. Local Leads the Way is a offshoot, I think you'd say, of the Climate to Thrive. That's up in NPI. And you all can join in. If you go to a Climate to Thrive and then look under it, you'll find Local Leads the Way. And, and I honestly avoid groups whenever possible. But once I join in on these calls, they're Zoom calls. They're really easy to do that at four in the afternoon on Mondays or something. So they're really easy. But what you find is there will be maybe 20, 30 people from all over the state who are wrestling with these exact same issues that we're all thinking about and talking about. Some of them are here. Some of them are here on the level of accomplishments. But it turns out that it's actually really a, a, a wonderfully good feeling to talk to other people who are sharing mm -hmm. what you're going through. And plus you meet people and you see people who have really wonderful careers. And it's it's really fun. It's like a it's it's one of the I I avoid these things and I still love doing it. So, <laughs> so I I want to speak to that too because <sighs> Um, yes, local lead the what leads the way is the first Monday of every month, 4 p.m. Zoom call. Um, Joanna Blackman, the uh, executive director of A Climate to Thrive, is organizing a local leads the way conference on Saturday, October 21st. I believe it's in Hollowell or Gardner. I can't remember where it is. But it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be a wonderful conference, and you'll all be hearing more about it. I'll be because I, she kind of sucked me in to be on the committee. So <laughs> I'm helping. <laughs> so you'll hear more about it. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And it's specifically to help um, not just um, advisory committees to cities, municipalities, to people like us that are trying to organize and to collaborate together. So more to come on that. And thank you, Fred, for bringing that up. 
uh, might consider, perhaps you want to consider the idea of a neighborhood house, you know, house party and get together and talk about um, collective kinds of actions that can take place in your neighborhood. Questions? Um, so, I, I um, to help you get to the end, I, I imagine this is where you want to help. Where I'm wondering about too is um, what are the next steps going to be? Um, because I know we're getting winding down. You know, will there continue to be talks um, here at the library or meetings around climate change so that we can organize? You know, uh, more locally even than Hollowell. <laughs> And so I don't know if it's going to be the climate committee or like, where is that organizing a follow up going to come from? Know. She's looking at I me. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Well, thank you, Bindi. I think you're talking about all Belfast climate dialogues. Yeah. Yes, the funding for the grant project ends at the end of August. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's going away, okay? I mean, it's a hot topic. It's a important crucial topic so we will continue to collaborate and offer programming um it might look a little different because i won't have my team helping me that um but you know it's not like i'm going to tie a bow on it and put it on the shelf oh cool okay <laughs> it will be archived but we'll keep it going and i let you know probably still coordinate with the climate crisis committee as things come up and welcome any of your suggestions and in whatever way I can help people come together to create a climate action network, I'm all ears and willing to help. So, there you go. Oh, I just want to say one more thing. August 29th, we're having our capstone here where we'll talk more about this and share our thoughts of what we learned and a lot more than um, what you what I just said. <laughs> there. Just wanted to say thanks for the great work, and um, I I might have missed it. I I read the plan, and I got here a little bit late, so I apologize. But did the committee um, uh, consider recommending uh, not this, the committee recommend to the city that we really need to be looking in terms of uh, climate for any further development. Belfast is growing. We have industries who want to come here. We have to look in terms of what effect it will have on our carbon footprint. So I just wondered if the committee got into that, just because it's a recommendation of many things. Um, it just seems like an essential one to me as well. Thanks. There is in the uh, in the document itself, in the climate action plan, um, in the introduction, uh, a notion about um, that you know climate has to be a consideration in every single action going forward by the city. So if we're talking about uh, you know building more affordable housing. Well, uh, built into that vision has to be. Um, the how are you going to heat and cool these uh, structures? How are you going to handle stormwater runoff? How are you going to handle you know all those aspects so that um, rather than kind of silo kind of thinking, we're going to build these houses, we're going to build these houses, but uh, we understand that those houses are going to affect the neighborhoods around them, and they're going to affect the stormwater runoff, and they're going to affect. Uh, water usage and wastewater. So um, all of those things have to be built in to everything going forward. And part of our task and our um, vision from our committee, and we hope with your participation, is to constantly be beating that drum for the city that, you know, that you got a proposal for you know, we got this housing committee that can work on more affordable housing. Well, it's got to be done with a climate lens. Transportation, you know, going to rethink about how we're going to uh, change some of the way 
things move in the city, it has to be done with a climate lens. We're going to beat that job. We need you to beat that job. That's right. <laughs> uh, just a comment to say, yeah, I think that's what I'm thinking about. The devil is in the details, so they could adopt this plan, but then, you know, it could just sort of um, not get much implemented, and, and it is in all the details. So I'm thinking of the zoning that suddenly put, I know, our former property on Crocker Road in an area of um, optimal, you know, four unit or whatever, apartment buildings for affordable housing, but there's good soil there for local, farm, you know, soil for, for gardening. So to think about those sorts of details and how will we be sure the planning committee really can is really able to interpret this in the way you hope they do. I think uh, Fred should talk about prime farmland and those things. Well, while, while you're bringing the microphone, I, it's all up to you. You all have to go to city council and planning board yes. meetings and that's okay. Now you can try. Just like they're just not going to do it out of the goodness of their heart. <laughs> Great thing that has happened, thanks to John, is that the comprehensive plan for the first time, the That's plan right. that was just released and approved, yeah. has elements of climate change built into it. Yeah. That never was the case in the past. So there's progress being made. And that the good news about the comprehensive plan is it has the force of law behind it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let me also just say that <clears throat> comprehensive plan now for the first time in its critical resources map includes soils of statewide significance. They were never on there before. And when Tractor Supply was built on the, some of the best yeah. soil in our town, I was sad. Tell them how to reach you guys. We, talk about um, limiting or agreeing to plan and build with taking um, greenhouse gases in mind and soils in mind, that's gonna require ordinances. You're gonna have to modify the planning code if you wanna take into account the greenhouse gas emissions of new development. And so we are proposing that that be done, but the next step as you say, uh, the devil's in the details. So it's gotta get done by ordinance. Both the comprehensive plan and the climate action plan are proposed outlines for future action. But it's up to the city council to implement them by specific activities. And so, as Brenda said, contact your city councilor if you're interested. <laughs> and also talk to your neighbors. There's nothing more effective. I mean, this, little committee is not very effective in front of the city council. For some reason, I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> but a bunch of neighborhoods can be effective. Yeah. Um, so uh, we encourage you to be active. Mm -hmm. On that point, I'm just wondering, we talked about collaboration, and I think the idea of the neighborhoods and all is, is a great thing. Uh, but I guess two things that I'd be interested in going forward is, one, how can we help you? And then two, what else can we do as individuals? Now, we mentioned, or someone brought up about ordinance, or John brought up about ordinances, and then about the planning board and making decisions, but most of us aren't in tune with what's going on all the time. And that's where maybe like some sort of joint email address. Uh, so they're like, there could be notices that going out to anybody in this room or anybody on Zoom who's interested in these things that could show up and support an ordinance change or support something else. So those are my questions. Do you have and, experience writing newsletters? <laughs> you have an answer? No. Um, well, uh, there are certainly um, joining our committee would be great. Yep. We, we 
which three of us right now, and it's a committee that is designed to have nine people on. So um, we would love uh, to see some new members uh, come on board. Clearly, um, paying attention to um, the uh, agenda for city council meetings, planning board uh, meetings um, is important in that information is accessible on uh, the city website. Uh, and uh, also, um, you know, because um, we have this committee doesn't mean that there um, shouldn't be, uh, you know, citizen, uh, you know, a citizen's action network, or, uh, you know, that someone here takes it upon themselves to start organizing, talking to three or four neighbors, uh, contacting people in other neighborhoods, building a network um, that um, shares emails and information. And certainly um, if something like that gets um, developed, then um, you can be feeding ideas to us and we can be feeding information to you and particular things that uh, it would be great if there were lots of voices engaged in. So, um, and, I, and I know that Brenda has been saying for quite some time with the ending of uh, ABCD, we need some other organization, um, citizen organization to step forward and say, let's continue this story. Let's continue these conversations. Uh, let's continue the flow of information and ideas. Two or three people in this room could get together, start that, uh, be the, the germination of that, and we will feed into that. You'll feed into us. Uh, other programs will take place at the library, but we can get that network of information going. It just takes two or three people to say. So I'm going to pass this I'm around. If it. you want to get your name and start, if you want to be part of starting something, put your name and your email. Introduce yeah. yourself. Well, no, just, I mean, okay. you can do an email. Okay. Yeah, like, who are you? Can, yeah. Oh, who, <laughs> inter me introduce yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, not so <laughs> <you don't. laughs> I've been talking to her for a long time. I know, time. not coming to the library anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that same experience here. Uh, my name is Kate Hansen, and I'm on the board of the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition. So um, I am not agreeing to organize this whole thing, but I can't see all of you sitting here and hear all of you saying we need to get people together, not to take advantage of getting the names and emails of people who might want to do that. So, so name Name and email. Okay. Yep. And then I, I'll send out something to everybody and we'll figure out where to go. From what about a Facebook page for? Oh, no, no, no. No, I mean, uh, uh, no one likes Facebook. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> yeah. Maybe if you want to do it. But just for right yeah, now, you, if I don't you want think to say you anything. would like to further the discussion just about say, some kind of citizen you want me to? action I, I yeah. around climate, right. this would be the time to do that. All right. All right. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think now it's about eight o'clock. We need to wrap up just to let you all go. But thank you all so much for coming. Again, thank the Climate Crisis Committee or CE News Team, whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you. And it's, it's really encouraging that you all want to do more. I'm hearing that from you. So let's get that happening. So thank you. It'll take a second. No, it's not. 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 It's I'm going to go to the next one. 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 I